Okay, nice. Uh, so for this is we are going to go over a Jupyter notebook that can be found on where say folder on week zero content. You can go to week zero and you can go to week zero and where say folder and you can find the Jupyter notebook. And we are going to go over that. So today's session is going to be about topic modeling and sentiment analysis. I think we have already gone through basic Python libraries that we are going to work on and the basic data science workflow. We are going to talk more about those terms in the weeks to come, starting from week one especially. But for now, we are going to focus on topic modeling and sentiment analysis because I think task three and four are more related, related to, top, to topic modeling and sentiment analysis, right? Okay, so uh, what's topic modeling? Before going on, I think we need to understand about topic modeling. Also on the assignment or on this task, uh, you are supposed to do or the task is to uh, work on topic modeling for the data that was given. But the first thing is to understand what topic modeling uh, itself means. So topic modeling is a type of statistical model for discovering the abstract topics that occur in collection of texts. And topic models are built on the idea of semantics or our documents that are actually being governed by some hidden or latent variables that we are not observing. And uh, I think this sentence isn't much clear we need to understand more about the terms topic and about modeling. So let's just say that as an example, let's just say that we have a bunch of uh, text documents that we have to analyze. And uh, maybe you have a couple of magazines that you want to know what those magazines are talking about. What you'd normally do or what someone would normally do is you will go over each and every document of the magazines and uh, try to generalize or try to tell someone, let's say your manager or your boss ask you, asks you what those magazines are talking about. So what you generally do is, what you'd normally do is you'll go over the contents and you read all of the uh, pages of those magazines and you'll have to report back to your boss or manager about what those magazines or any uh, letters are talking about. So doing that might be easy if the document is small, but when the document is very big or large or collected through a longer amount, longer duration of time, that would be impossible, almost impossible. So what topic modeling does is it helps us to understand large data sets uh, and recognize words from the topics present in the document or the corpus of the data. So through a modeling system or through machine learning model, what we can do is we can extract terms or significant uh, topics that are present in the to in, in the documents or in the magazines and uh, present that to our customers or our manager or our boss. So easily by using machine learning model, we can extract a very key topics from a set of documents or from a set of uh, magazines uh, by using a machine learning model without having to go through each uh, document. Uh, is, is, is that clear or are we clear on the definition of topic modeling or why would, we, why would we need topic modeling? Okay. Uh, yes, two years. it's clear for me. Okay. I want to hear from someone who wants a bit more explanation. Anyone or are we good to go? Okay, then. Okay. Uh, so let's say someone comes to you and asks you uh, to read a list of documents, for example, magazines, and report back to them about what those topics uh, are saying or what, what are those magazines talking about or what are those magazines speaking about? So let's say you have an old magazine collected by different people and you have to read all of the documents or all of the magazines and report back to your 
manager or someone you are supposed to report to about what those magazines are saying. For example, uh, if, if there is a sports magazine, you definitely say, say, say that this is a sports magazine and it's talking about sports or different clubs or so on. And if it's about technology, you say that it's talking about technology and it's using this disease and this kind of technology, right? But when the text document starts to get a bit more larger or when you have uh, lots of documents that you have to process, that wouldn't be feasible for someone to read through the to go through the entire documents and understand what those topics are, uh, what those uh, letters or magazines are talking about, right? So using topic modeling, topic modeling, I think, yes, topic modeling, almost yes, it summarizes the texts that are present in the documents. It tried to catch key phrases and it will try to uh, correlate with the whole content of the document and uh, return back the essential topics that the document are talking about. Is it a bit more clear or more confusing? Yes, yes it is. Okay, great. Uh, anyone? Any confusion? Okay, uh, okay, confusing. Gilbert, can you speak up? Gilbert? Uh, which part did you not understand? Maybe you can write up if you can't speak. Uh, yes, yes, Abna, I think we are going to uh, uh, we are going to have a look when once we start the coding part, but the machine learning model is what identifies. It doesn't just pick a random word uh, based on uh, the frequency of appearance in the document, but it also tries to correlate with the whole document or with the whole content and it will make or it will try to extract some words which are more related with the content of the document and return back those topics. For example, uh, you'd definitely say that after reading a sports article or a sports uh, document, you will say that this is talking about sports or you, this is talking about technologies or this is talking about politi politics, right? So topic modeling is also doing the same thing, not only because a word is being repeated uh, frequently, but it will also try to analyze with the whole content of the document and try to extract topics that are relevant for that document and uh, try to return back words which are relevant for that, uh, for that document. Yes, we, we'll talk about the methods more. Uh, Okay, I think we can go on, we can move on and we can uh, discuss the implementation phase. Uh, I just want uh, I, I just want you to uh, understand what topic modeling is and why would we need uh, why we would need topic modeling uh, to process data. Okay, so uh, topic modeling is an unsupervised approach. Uh, I think uh, b b before going on, we should clear this specific term, right? What's unsupervised learning or what's unsupervised approach? I know some of you might be familiar with the term, but uh, just to make sure that everyone is on the same ground, I think it's best to uh, define what unsupervised learning is. And if there is unsupervised, clearly there is also a supervised way of learning. Uh, what do you guys think is unsupervised learning and what's supervised learning? Okay, Johannes. Uh, yeah, uh, as we know, uh, machine learning is classified into uh, three types, uh, mm -hmm. like supervised, unsupervised, and then reinforcement learning. Uh, when we define unsupervised machine learning, it is a type of uh, machine learning algorithm uh, that learns a patterns uh, from uh, unclassified data. We cannot label data before uh, feeding into the machine learning. Uh, so the main difference between the supervised and the supervised is supervised is already labeled data is given to machine learning, uh, whereas in super unsupervised learning, we cannot label the data when we feed into the machine learning. Okay, 
Perfect. This is what I understand. Great. Michael? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, machine learning, uh, like Johannes uh, said, is uh, divided or classified into three categories, and uh, they are uh, like uh, supervised learning and supervised learning and semi-supervised learning. Uh, the main difference between each of them is uh, that uh, when we say about the supervised learning, it uses a label data that the machine or the model we are building is constricted to study the patterns that we provided between the input and the output or the label and whereas the uh, unsupervised uh, learning or unsupervised approach uh, uh, gives the freedom to for the model for the machine learning model to extract some features or some relationships out of the data without providing any label and that of the semi-supervised or uh, uh, the semi-supervised learning is uh, somehow it's a hybrid between the two uh, supervised learning um, I, I mean machine learning approach that's all thank you yes that's completely correct thank you Mohammed. yes uh, as the previous guy says uh, they are completely correct supervised learning is about you have uh, input data and you have uh, target data or label data so as the name mentioned supervised this means there is an output or target and your uh, task is just try to uh, make your algorithm when there is uh, new data input to, uh, to it you try to uh, predict or uh, give an output that uh, look like the label itself so supervised learning is is, is it like is there is a, a diet that try to give you some instruction like a child when it try to for example try to uh, walk and the, the, you give him an instruction to walk, uh, tell him what is right and what's wrong that is uh, uh, the mission of the target or the leap in unsupervised learning actually there is no guide at all uh, so your task is try to make clusters for example or uh, on that you do that by trying to find the inner relationship between points uh, or between data itself and uh, try using this inner relationship to make clusters uh, uh, an example of that for example uh, when you try you are given um, like let's say a uh, uh, size of shirts of people and try to categorize them to medium small and large so uh, the uh, algorithm itself can try to uh, find, for example, the distance or uh, 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 categorize them according to the size, how many uh, uh, the given sizes, how many of them are like, uh, uh, like near each other. So uh, according to this point, uh, this uh, given data, it will categorize it to small, medium, and large. Uh, and actually, there is no constraints. Uh, you you may put it uh, some a little bit constraints to try to uh, give this uh, out. Uh, sorry for uh, taking too long. No, no problem. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, last person will be Ad Ajat. Uh, sorry if I'm um, Okay. Uh, topic topic modeling is an unsupervised machine learning technique, uh, which means that it does not require training training her model before before we let it automatically analyze text. Unlike topic classification, which is the supervised machine learning, so that that needs training. So topic topic modeling needs no training. Thank you. Uh, so sorry, Ajat. Maybe can you explain a bit more what you mean by it needs no training for topic modeling? I mean, does we we wouldn't have to first train our model with the sets of data uh, before, before trying to analyze? Okay, with what data? Sorry, I didn't get that. We, we don't have to, 
we don't have to train the model with a set of data, like a training data, mm. before mm. we send in another, another the, the the one we want to validate mm. to analyze because it's an it's it's an unsuperv it's an unsupervised learning machine learning technique. Mm. Yes, correct. Yes, I think everyone has said it right. Uh, just to summarize what you guys have already said, uh, supervised, in supervised learning, there is a label data, which basically means that each data, each training data is labeled. Uh, and when the model starts training, it will try to look uh, the labels that are provided and the cost function will work on the labels that were provided. Uh, a very simple example would be, for example, let's take uh, a face recognition, not okay. Maybe let's make it much more simpler and let's take, for example, a classification model which classifies uh, if a picture is a cat or a dog. And what you would do is, or what you would implement in the machine learning model, or what you would give to the machine learning model is a set of pictures with their labels. Their labels will be cat or dog in, a, in an encoded format for the machine learning, but normally you will give the pictures and the labels. The labels are the, the, the names, the name of the picture. It might be a cat or a dog. So when the model starts to learn, it will learn if a picture is a cat or a dog based on the labels that's given. So finally, when you give it a new data set that the model hasn't seen, it will classify based on the, the, the training that the machine learning model uh, go, gone over. So in unsupervised learning, there will be no labels. So when we are going to try to classify, for example, something, there won't be any labeling. And the model is going to attempt to learn some kind of structure from the data that was given without seeing any label or without being exposed to any label. And it will extract the useful information or feature from the data that's given. So it's going to learn how to create a mapping from the given data or from the given input to a particular output by uh, analyzing the data and learning the structure of it, even when no label is given to the data. And in the supervised learning, which is the opposite, labels are given and the model is being trained based on the labels that are given. While in the unsupervised learning, there will be no labels and the model will learn the structure based on the data given. I think the uh, one of the most popular examples in unsupervised learning is the K-means clustering. Uh, if you are not unfamiliar with that, maybe uh, it's just something that will uh, divide uh, a set of data or a set of uh, objects into some clusters and some given clusters, and it will try to partition them. Uh, I'm thinking of giving, uh, yes, I think one of the examples that can be given is, for example, let's say you, you, are, you have trained a data based on K-means clustering. A K-means clustering just try to classify a given data and uh, for example, when there is some kind of machine learning algorithm which will detect if uh, a person is a male or a female based on a given height and weight, it will try to divide some kind of, uh, it will try to plot some kind of line based on the given uh, height and weight. So some part of the data based on the given height and weight, it will be classified to male and some part of it will be classified to female. Uh, is, is it clear or is there any confusion? Anyone? Yeah, it's clear for me. Okay. Uh, so is it clear for everyone? Okay, I'll try to summarize once more. So in the supervised learning, what I've said before, what everyone has been saying, uh, the training is based on the labeled data. So each data of the training data set is labeled based on the example that I've given. If there is an algorithm, if, if there is an, a machine learning algorithm, which will try to classify if a picture is a cat or a dog, you will give to the training data the labels of the pictures. So let's say you have about 10,000 training sets. So for each training sets, 
the labels will also be fed to the machine learning model. So each picture will also be mapped or labeled to the uh, output or to the expected output. You know, in that case, if it's either a cat or a dog in supervised learning. But in unsupervised learning, there are no labels given for the data. The, data, the, the machine learning algorithm will by itself try to uh, learn the data structure from the given data set and try to cluster or try to classify uh, the data based on the structure that it learned without being given any kind of uh, label. Uh, Josias? Okay, perfect. Uh, so I think we can now continue. So topic modeling is unsupervised approach. So what we mean by, okay, can someone maybe uh, tell me why topic modeling is unsupervised after uh, what we have discussed? Why do you think topic modeling is unsupervised? Michael. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I think uh, topic modeling is definitely it's uh, an unsupervised approach since we are working with uh, like when we are working with uh, a magazine, for example, we, uh, when we are working with a magazine uh, or some uh, analysis of uh, documents, the, the machine learning model will be allowed or will be given all the text documents or all the uh, files that we have uh, not uh, a label that it says this is uh, for example if we are trying to make a model that can classify between the uh, articles in a magazine to say it, it is a sports article it is a political article it is an mm -hmm. entertainment article uh, we will not give it uh, some uh, label to say uh, or to compare with uh, what it have and what uh, we have, but it uh, will uh, only analysis or uh, analyze or go through the document and provide uh, an insight of uh, different topics and subtopics and uh, aggregately that it can uh, move to some conclusion where the focus of that particular article is uh, sport or political or entertainment. Yes, thank you, Michael. Yeah, thank you, as name Joseph. That's correct as well. So, uh, topic modeling is unsupervised learning, and uh, we'll have two uh, sections for this session. The first one is topic modeling, and the second one is sentiment analysis. Sentiment analysis is used in social media monitoring, allowing business to gain insights about how customers feel about certain topics and detect urgent issues in real time before they spiral out of control. So, uh, our task is, or what sentiment analysis is, that it tries to, cal to classify a data based on the semantics of the data that was given. So for example, you have social media data, for example, we are using Twitter. So uh, from the tweets that are coming, we want to classify if the tweets are, if the tweet sentiments are positive or negative. Uh, so if there is some kind of hate speech or some kind of negative feedback, we want to know if the tweets or if the data that's been collected are positive or negative. For companies, it means that they can collect reviews on their product and they will classify if the sentiments are more positive or negative so that they can work more on their product. So when there are lots of reviews, uh, for most companies, there are lots of reviews being given each day and they are not classifying or they are not going uh, through the reviews manually. But what they are going to do is they they have they already have some kind of sentiment analysis uh, model and that sentiment analysis will classify if the reviews that, that that are being given for the company is positive or negative so that they can improve their product or work more on the product and uh, yes try to improve their experience with their customer uh, we'll talk more about sentiment analysis later so for now uh, we are going to discuss more about topic modeling and its implementation and the first thing is loading the necessary libraries. Uh, I think one of the top libraries that we are going to use, the most important libraries that we are going to use are Pandas, JSM, and Kyle Davis, which are really important for topic modeling. There are also other libraries, but these libraries really go well with Python, and we'll be using Pandas, JSM, and Kyle Davis. 
And so we'll be importing those libraries. We'll be importing Matplotlib. I think we have already gone through the important libraries in Python on yesterday session. And Seaborn is for, for visualization, Matplotlib and Seaborn are for visualization. Jainism is a library for topic modeling. And we'll be using some libraries from Jainism. And from uh, we'll be, Pandas is for reading CSV files and other documents. Pprint, Pprint is similar to print, but the difference from print is that pprint is able to print uh, complex data structures. For example, when you want to print uh, some kind of list or nested, uh, for example, a JSON file, when you try to print a JSON file using print, it will only try to print using a single line. But if you want the whole structure of the JSON file to be printed, you can use pprint. This is a built-in library and pprint will be able to uh, print the whole, the, the complex data structure. We'll be using string OS and re, we'll be using re, it's a regular expression to pre-process the data. OS and string are also another pre-built libraries. Uh, so for this data, uh, for this uh, session, we'll be using uh, the file that was shared yesterday on Tuesday's folder. You can find uh, a clean fintech data and we'll be using that to uh, model the topic from the data. So the first thing is I just uh, loaded, uh, we, I just uh, wrote a, a simple script. This is a simple script to load data. So this data will be able to load uh, based on the class structure or object oriented structure. And after initializing, maybe I should uh, run the document uh, with you. You guys can get the copy and maybe try to write. I'm using a collab environment. A collab environment is similar to Jupyter Notebook, but uh, it gives you, uh, it's the fastest way to experiment on some things, but uh, it's not preferable to work on uh, larger projects because uh, it's, it has a limited number of uh, GPU and TPU when working on a real project, but it's really a good approach or a great way to experiment on your data. Uh, so on Colab, I, I will try to, I'll first import the data that are required for the topic modeling. And after the importing the data, the first thing to do is mounting uh, the drive because I already have that uh, CSV file on my drive. I will mount my drive uh, to Colab. So this will give access uh, to Google Drive to be able to read data, to read contents from uh, Google Drive. I've already done that, but if you are doing this for the first time, it will prompt you and uh, ask you to check some checkboxes and uh, accept that request. After mounting, I will define a basic data loader class. We should be able to load data, the CSV data, which we are going to uh, work, uh, which we, we are going to make the topic modeling. Then after, my, my, my declaring data is inside my drive. So I will load that data uh, using the, the, the above class that was defined. So I've loaded that, I've dropped the null columns and the links of the tweets or the links of the data is about 5,621 rows. This is uh, smaller, but uh, most of the time, mostly when working on a real uh, world project, you will get much more higher number of tweets. So you'll be able to work on uh, topic modeling for larger data sets. And this is the data that was the, the summary of the data. It contains the original text and the clean text. The clean text uh, is the minor cleaning, which will only remove some duplicates, convert the data types to the appropriate data types that, we, that, that, that that's required. But uh, other data pre-processing is required because there might be some punctuations. As you can see here, there is an apostrophe and we'll have to uh, remove that or pre-process that. So for the data preparation, there are a set of steps that are to be followed. Uh, the first thing is, the first thing is to only select an English language. So we want to discard other languages that are not English because uh, we want only to make the topic modeling for English language. So the first task is to remove English language, uh, to only select English language. After selecting English language, uh, we are selecting the clean text and we are casting it to string. Uh, it's, it might be string, but we want to make sure it's string because we are going to perform other operations that are 
only applicable to uh, strings. So after casting it to string, the next thing is we are going to convert every uh, letter to lowercase because on topic modeling or in fact any other machine learning model, we don't care that if a specific uh, word is in uppercase or lowercase. So to make it consistent, we'll convert that to, to the lowercase. And finally, to remove the punctuations, um, let me try to wrap. Okay, I can't wrap on Google Colab. But uh, the next step is to remove the punctuation. So to remove the, the punctuation, the apply keyword, uh, if, you're, if you guys are not familiar with that, apply keyword will uh, be able to run the given uh, function or the lambda function. In Python, lambda functions are uh, functions that can be defined without uh, without giving a name for that function or it will run automatically. It's anonymous function uh, in other words. So apply what apply will do is it will run this function for every row of that column. So we have a column called clean text and what apply function will do is it will run this specific function for each row of the, uh, for, for each row of this clean text uh, column. So the first thing what it will do is it will cast it to string, then it will convert it to lowercase. And finally, it will remove the punctuations from uh, each row of the data. So x.translate, what translate will do is it will first try to replace any characters from the first given uh, argument with the second argument, but we are leaving it uh, as empty or as space, so it won't do anything. But the third argument is to remove any character that's in here or in the argument from the text. So string.punctuation in Python returns punctuations in the string. So it will remove all of the punctuations from the string. So uh, using this set, using this set, uh, what we are going, what we are doing is we are removing first we are casting it to string and converting it to lowercase and finally removing all of the punctuations. Uh, I think all of you are familiar, I'm guessing everyone is familiar with uh, list compression in Python, right? List compressions are simply, let me just go over a simple command and I've shared my full screen, the whole screen, right? Mm, yes. Okay, can you see my terminal? Can anyone confirm that? Okay, perfect. So I'm going to the Python interactive shape and what I'm, let me just show you what this compression is. Uh, for example, if you want to append the numbers from zero to nine into a list, for example, let's say that you have a list X equals 20, then you would iterate through each uh, number from zero to nine and append to that uh to, to the list x but in list compression what you can do is list compression what you can do is you can open a list and you can say uh num in range of 10. so what this will do is it will append all of the numbers in the range range will start from zero up up until now the stop uh, or the last element will be nine so Sorry for that. And then in for now, in, yes. And finally, if I print like this comp, it will uh, include all of the elements from zero to nine. So this compression is similar to for loops, but much more efficient way of uh, iterating through iter iterable objects in uh, in terms of uh, time management and time time efficiency and time complexity. So for what we are going to do, especially when we are doing the feature engineering part, we are using list compression. So I hope uh, these things are clear. So the first thing is when working on the on this processing, we are basically working on natural language processing. Okay, is that a question? Okay, so the first thing we are doing is for each tweet in the clean text, we are iterating through each tweet and we are storing each of the rows of the clean text uh, column inside a list. And we are, I think it, it would be best to work this on, 
on Visual Studio Code. Let me just try to Uh, okay, so the first thing is we are appending all of the data. Let us maybe take some kind of sample which will uh, hold us the holder as a placeholder for the clean text. Let me try to define the data and let's say uh, maybe batch six thing. And the next, the next one can be maybe topic modeling tutorial. And then uh, uh, any suggestions? Yes, maybe you can use any suggestions or text reporting. And yes, Pen Academy. Maybe let's add one more, which will uh, contain duplicate data course content on data science and data engineering. So this will be the, just assume that this is the clean text uh, column. So it, it has a bunch of uh, rows in it. We have only taken, we have only taken the sample of that. So after taking, after taking that, the next step is to, uh, uh, this is what we have done, but the next step is splitting each uh, words or tokenizing each words uh, into, a, into a separate word. Maybe let me uh, put that part and keep tokens. I can, uh, okay, yes, I can maybe text for text. In. So this is what this tries to do is for each text in the data uh, column, it will split each of the sentences into a separate words and put them in, in a list. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, I'm sorry, can you see my screen, right? Hello? Yes, we can see. Okay, uh, sorry, light was out. So, uh, text mm -hmm. for text in. Okay. Yes. Okay, so now if I print the tokens, uh, you can see that it splits each of the contents of the uh, of the rows into a separate word. This is called in machine learning or natural language processing tokenization, which will try to separate or filter out to, to separate each word from the sentence. And we are going to work on each uh, words of the uh, corpus or of the data that we have. So this is splitting the data because we want to model the topic based on the words that we have. Maybe later we can see more uh, into bigrams and trigrams, which will try to uh, get data of two words or three words or so on. Maybe we, we can, we'll see that later. And the next thing is to create a dictionary. So in Jainism, there is a library of creating a dictionary because we are going to feed the data that we have or this text that we have into the model of the machine learning model. We want 
to convert each of the, the words into a number or into a numerical variable. And for that, there is a library called corpora in Jainism, we should be able to uh, convert each of the uh, words into a number or it will give a unique ID for each of the words that we have. Let me just copy this and put it here in corpora. Okay. Let me import JSON. Yes. So from JSON, there is the corpora. Okay. JSON dot corpora dot dictionary and the word list will be eight tokens. So what word to ID does is maybe if we print it. So you can see that there are 21 unique tokens. It's generated the unique tokens out of the word data out of, out of the word sets that we have. So if there are duplicates, for example, you can see that data is duplicate, right? It will take only one of them and give an ID for the uh, word data. So there is batch, there is training. It generates a unique ID for each of the words that you have, and it will give them a unique ID. Then we can go on and uh, see. Uh, we can create a bug, a bug of words. So a bug of words is after generating unique tokens using the dictionary. What dictionary does is it generates a unique tokens. Then there is a method to be called called dog to bow or bug of words. So what bug of words does is it will uh, it will map each of the unique uh, tokens that are given to their frequencies. So for example, in our case, data appeared twice in our data. So it will give this IDs uh, key to the frequency that this key is appearing. So data will be mapped to two and others will be mapped to one. Maybe let me just copy that and show that to you. Is that like uh, an histogram or something like that? Uh, like like what? Histo histogram. Uh, no, hist histogram, you're referring to the visualization tool, right? Yes. Uh, yes, I think I, I get what you're saying. Histogram also tries to uh, visualize or, uh, yes, to visualize the frequency of each of the uh, keys that, that, are, that are given. This is somehow similar, but what it does is it will map each of the unique IDs given to their frequencies. So that later when we are going to the topic, I think we can see that later when we go to the topic modeling, but let me just show you what it will uh, do. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Talk to. Sorry. So this should be printing eight tokens. Yes. So now, if I print this, uh, you can see that the zeros key or the, the the zeros ID appears one times. The one also appears one times, and everything appears one times. And we should also get one of them should be appearing. Yes. The later seven, the unique ID, the ID given seventeen is appearing twice. So this 17 should be uh, the data uh, cured. Maybe we can visualize that by using, uh, I think we can call the word to ID dot, uh, there is a library token to ID, yes. So what the method token to ID from the dictionary created does is it will uh, show us the values for each mapped data. So, uh, here we can see six is mapped to zero, batch is mapped to one, training is mapped to two, topic is mapped to three, and so on. It will start from zero and it will map each word to a unique ID. So if you had hundreds of or thousands of uh, uh, words, it will be mapped to a unique ID. So if you try to find data, yes, data is the 17th index or the 17th ID. And it's when we are using the dog to bow method, the 17th ID is mapped to two. So it's appearing twice. So what dog to bow or bug, what this bug of word is trying to do is it creates or it maps the IDs generated above 
to their frequencies or to their occurrence frequencies. I think there are also other met methods that are uh, much more efficient than uh, bug of force. I think one of them is DF by DF, which stands for term frequency inverse document frequency, which will also, in addition to mapping to their frequencies, it will give the weight of each word. Uh, for example, there is the word, uh, yes, there is one of the words here, right? But it shouldn't have equal weight for the topic modeling with the other words because the word the word D appears most often in most documents. So what TFID will try to do is if the, if the occurrence of a specific uh, word is much higher than the others, it will reduce the weight. And if it's lower, it will increase the weight uh, by doing some kind of algorithm. So TFID is similar to bug of words. It will map the unique IDs to their number of occurrences. But in addition to that, it will also give or it will also assign some kind of weight to their occurrences. There are multiple approach, but yes, you can also go on and explore. Let me just comment that here. If I did, you can look into uh, term frequency inverse document frequency, and it is similar to bug of force, but it will also uh, include some kind of weighting for each word that are present. And the final thing is, yes, this was a function defined in a class, a method defined in a class. So what we did was we initialized that with the Twitter or with the TweetStiff uh, class, with the TweetStiff text corpus, and we are finally extracting the ID to word in the corpus. We are primarily interested in the corpus and to the ID to word. The corpus is the one that we found finally after uh, using the bug of words and the ID to word is the specific mapping of each word to the ID. So for example, uh, six was mapped to zero, but was mapped to one, so it was mapped to two. This is what the text to the ID to word contains. And the corpus is the final one after the bug of words is generated. So uh, finally, yes, I printed the ID word. So babies was mapped to one. Uh, Babies is one, baby is one, becoming is one. This is the appearance or the frequencies after using the bug of words. Uh, and finally, when going to the topic modeling, there are multiple models uh, to build for topic modeling. And one of the most popular or the most used topic modeling uh, is the latent reclate allocation. Latent reclate allocation gives us a model uh, to, uh, to, to to be trained and to extract relevant topics from the data. And it's very simple. We just have to pass uh, specified parameters and it will be able to uh, generate those topics uh, for us. So the first one that we are going to pass is the corpus. The corpus is the data that was generated and the ID to word, the ID to word is the specific mapping for each word to an ID and we can specify the number of topics. So because this is unsupervised learning, the data by itself or the model by itself doesn't know into how many partition or into how many categories that the data needs to be classified. So we are specifying here uh, to five, but this isn't the best approach. I will maybe later show you how to also train based on different number of topics and we can choose the best uh, the best topic, the best number of topics that will be representable for our data. In random state, this is just serves as a seed. And if <clears throat> if someone wants to repeat that the this training, uh, we'll be able to get the same data. And update every is just updates every on every chunk. So the chunk size is the number of documents to be considered at once or to be inserted at once. And the update every will be run on the chunks, on the amount of chunks that are entered on every hundred chunks. And passes is similar to in the supervised learning, if you are familiar in the supervised learning, they are the number of epochs. It is the number of times this model will be able to run or to be able to learn. And there are other parameters that are called alpha and uh, beta in LD or latent reclate allocation. The, the hyperparameters that we are interested in tuning are alpha and beta. We, we, we have set alpha to auto, but we can 
uh, change that in prior round to get a bit much better uh, accuracy. So a low alpha value places more weight on having uh, each document composed of a, only a few dominant topics, and whereas having a high value of alpha will return many relatively dominant topics. And the, the second topic is the second hyperparameter is beta. I haven't included beta in this, but if you specify beta and if you give it a low value of beta, what it does is uh, it places more weight on having each topic uh, composed of only few document words. So the alpha and the beta are hyperparameters that we are interested in tuning more to get a better or much more efficient LDA model. So once we run this model, Okay, I, I don't think I've defined, I've run the above tips. Yes. Yes, so after running, after feeding the data that we received from the above inputs, this will train the data based on the corpus that's given, and this will, uh, classify into five clusters. So it will basically generate five kind of topics. So there will be five different types of topics that will be generated. So we want to know what those topics are. So this is the topics that the model generated. So for the topic zero or the first topic, it contains carbon, climate, GT, BP, change, land, in some kind of words with their assigned weights. There are some kind of weights assigned to each word and the higher the weight, I think it's more dominant uh, in that uh, category. So there are about five topics, but on real world but, or when implementing your project, what I really encourage you is to uh, play around by setting different amount of topics. You might go for 10, you might go for eight. There, are, there is a sample for that and see what base fits uh, for the topics that you are assigning. For example, 10 may, might be the best uh, amount of topics to use for this data set, or 20 might be the best one. So you love to go iteratively through different topic numbers. Uh, there is a separate code for that. And uh, okay, maybe you can see that later. So the next thing is the model analysis. After training the data, after training the data, after getting the topics, we want to know how good our model performed, or we want to be sure that if the data that was trained or if the model training was accurate enough for the data we have used. So one thing we can do is the perplexity, which is a measure of model quality in natural language processing and perplexity number of words. It describes how, how well a model, a model predicts a sample and how much it's perplexed by sample from the observed data. So what we are trying to find or what we are trying to look is the lower the score, the better the model for the given data. So if the score is lower, we can be sure that the model is good enough for us. So by using different number of topics and by, hyper, by tuning the hyperparameters, which are alpha and beta, if the perplexity matrix is smaller, we can be sure that the model uh, that we used is good enough. So to, uh, to calculate the perplexity model, the log perplexity is a method that can be found on the LDA model we uh, used above. So by passing the data, we can uh, calculate the perplexity uh, score and we can see that the perplexity is minus 6.7 and the coherence score is 0 0.58. So if you are training on different number of topics for different uh, sets of topics, the higher the currents, the better uh, our model is, but the lower the perplexity also indicates that our model is good enough. And finally, we can visualize by using Pile Davis, and Pile Davis is another library. We can install it in using pip, and by, uh, after installing it, you can visualize the data. So to visualize the data, we will import the Pile Davis. From the Pile Davis, there is another library that we can import, and we can give the model that was trained the corpus and the ID to work. These are the import the required parameters or the required arguments to be given so that we can get the visualization. So in the visualization, this is what uh, it will output. So we said or we went for five topics. So it will print five topics, five different topics, and 
the word contents that are in those topics. So for the third topic, these are the words that are most frequently appearing and uh, the, the, the bigger the, the, the bevel size or the size of the uh, circle, it means that it has more or dense amount of topics inside uh, this uh, category. So there are five topics. The more topics that you are using in your model training, the more number of bevels that you will be getting. So for each circle or for each bevel, for each topic, there are certain sets of words. Some are overlapping to each other because uh, it's not mutually exclusive. The data in topic modeling, if the data is found or if the word is found in one of the bevels, it doesn't mean that it, it has it shouldn't be found on the other because we are trying to model the topic from the entire corpus and words are not mutually ex exclusive. One word can appear in multiple uh, documents and uh, that's perfectly fine. And yes, so to train, this was what I was saying, you can train on different number of topics or different number of uh, K, K stands for the topics. Maybe you want to train for two, for, for three or for four or for any uh, amount of number that you want. So we are going to loop over from two to 25 topics, let's say for until 25. And we are going to generate or we are going to define a model uh, based on this number of topics. So when it's two, it will give it two. When it's three, it will give it three. And finally, we are saving the model. We are saving that model. And after saving that model, we can load all those models and we can print the coherence score. As I have said earlier, the better the coherence score is, we can be sure that that kind of, that amount of topic is the base that fits for our model. So we want to increase the coherence score. So we'll check the coherence score of all the models that we have trained and we'll choose the one that base fits for our uh, data or which has much higher coherence score than the others. Uh, I think this is all on topic modeling. Any question? Okay. Uh, do you have a question, Josias? Okay, Gideon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. As I had a question on saving the model. So after you save the model, you can just load it anytime you want, or will you have to import it? Yes, once you save the model, if you are uh, here, we are saving the model after each run, we are saving, there is a method on LDA model to save the model that's trained. And once it's uh, saved, you can import or load that model, which is similar to model loading in other Keras or any other library for machine learning. You can load that model and uh, check for the coherence score. Uh, so uh, after you've iterated over the the range from two to 24, you'll save the all those models and uh, you can load all the 20 something models anytime yes. you want. Okay. Yes, you can do that in time. When you are saving, it's saving to your local machine or to the directory that you're working. You can specify that specific directory. Or instead of saving it and loading it again, what you can do is take this specific coherence model uh, calculation and put it uh, inside this uh, and put it inside this uh, code section and you'll be able to calculate the scores of each uh, runs of the model. But if there are much larger number of topics, it might be hard to track or uh, to visualize. You can do either of them, but you can choose, yes, you can choose what works best for you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, Josias? Yes, hello. Hello. So, uh, I would like to know, we know that in, in supervised learning, we assess the, we assess the learning process mm -hmm. We try to analyze the learning curve. So I would like to know how we can assess the learning process in this case, since it is uh, unsupervised, unsupervised learning. 
Uh, yes, so as I've shown you here, one thing we can assess. So in supervised learning, what we can know is in the test set, we can check if the training or if the model is predicting or categorizing uh, the, 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 the test set that's been given. If, for example, if it's a cat or a dog, that's our, uh, okay, that's our measure for that or scoring meter for that, yeah? But in, current, in topic modeling, we can use the coherence score to calculate or to check if, a, if the model that we are using is working uh, correctly. Or we are more trying to optimize or to come to a point that it best fits our needs. For example, if you have a sports category, technology category, uh, politics category, we want to make sure that it best fits those categories. So words coming from the content should be, uh, for example, uh, election, uh, po political party should only go to the politics category and uh, words related to football, uh, basketball, or anything that's related to sports are going to sports category. So there isn't a perfect measure or a perfect red line which will be able to categorize if it's from the sports or from the uh, technology category, but we want to make sure as much as possible to fit the, the words to fit in, in the category that they are supposed to fit in. For that, we can use the current score and other uh, similar methods to measure if our model is working uh, well. Okay, now I have another question. Okay. I would like to know how, what is the meaning of the, of the perplexity, I think it's the metric used in this model. And uh, how we can use it in order to, to be sure that our model is good. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get the last part. Uh, we were, like were asking know, about the perplexity. Yes, I would, I would like to know the meaning of, of the metric and what, what uh, I, I would like to know how we can use the metrics in the in the analysis of the of the learning process. Uh, okay, uh, I'm not sure if I got that right, but the preferences metrics or the current model, the current score is just there to measure how good your model is performing or if it's classifying in the right way. So you might have different models with different hyperparameters and different number of uh, topics that you said earlier. And if there are multiple models, you want to make sure or you want to know which model is performing well or which model is categorizing uh, your words or the content of the corpus in the right topic that they are supposed to be. So for the perplexity, if the values are lower, the gooder the model is, the, 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 best the, the better the model is. And for the current score, the higher the current score is, the better the model is. It just serves as a way to indicate if a model is doing good or not. Okay, I get it. I think it's all for me. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, time has already gone. Yes, uh, Hinoch was also saying minimizing the errors in better inference in the better decision boundary between the data. Yes, because this is a classification problem. It tries to classify if you are trying, if you, if you can minimize the errors or if you can minimize the, the, the decision boundary, we can know for sure that our model is performing well. So what we can do is try to uh, minimize the boundary that the topics are being classified into. Okay, Tadiwa? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. All right, uh, sorry, I hope this is a quick question, but I'm curious, after you have trained your model, are you able to get the model to classify a specific tweet? Like, can you give a specific tweet to the model and then it tells you which of the five topics at that tweet best aligns to or something like that. Is that possible? Yes, yes, that's definitely possible. I haven't included that in this section, but I'll try to include it as soon as this session ends. But you can uh, get another words and 
you can know to which category those tweets or those words that you give uh, belong to. Ah, nice. Thank you. Okay. I, I, will, I will make sure to add that. Uh, uh, yes, before the sentiment analysis. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you can if we can go through the sentiment analysis, but the sentiment analysis is a classification of the tweets. It will classify if the tweets are positive, negative, or neutral. So this is another machine learning model that uh, we can use. For this, I've, I've, I've used airlines data. So using the airlines data, this is tweets about the airlines, different airlines data. There is a basic exploratory data analysis. I'm sorry about the timing, guys, but uh, let me just try to go over the content. Maybe you can have uh, a look more in depth later after the session ends. So there is exploratory data analysis, which will try to categorize the airlines data from which airlines, uh, how much each airlines category uh, uh, constitutes the entire data. And after making some kind of uh, exploratory data analysis, for example, based on the sentiments calculated, uh, most of the tweets are negative tweets. 21% of them are neutral and 16% are positive. And we can also see for each specific airlines, for almost all of them, the negative tweets are, uh, are higher than the neutral and the positive tweets. And after doing basic exploratory data analysis, we can go on data cleaning. We can pre-process data by removing uh, the special characters and we can also lemmatize or stain. By lemmatizing or staining, we mean that we, we need to uh, reduce the words to their root form. For example, I think I have, to, I have said this in another tutorial, but for example, if you have uh, the word, yes, having might be reduced to have. Uh, yes, it will try to reduce a word to their original form because what we care about is the word content itself. We don't want uh, different kinds of punctuations, different kinds of uh, special characters doesn't constitute for sentiment analysis. In fact, for some kind of uh, sentiment analysis, maybe for example, if there is a, a exclamation mark, it means it has a bit much more uh, emphasis on that uh, expression or on that sentiment. Uh, so we might choose to include some uh, special characters based on the data that we are going to work on or based on the model that we are going to develop, but most of the time we remove those special characters and reduce them to the root form. After uh, reducing them to the root form, we are going to rep represent them into the numeric form. Here we have used the TF-IDF model to create a bag of words, which will also include the weights of each words that we have seen earlier. And finally, we'll, train, we'll split the training seed into train and test data, and we can uh, use different types of uh, machine learning models to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to create the sentiment analysis model. And finally, you can predict if a tweet is negative or positive, and we can also evaluate that result. Uh, for this, we have got about 75%, but uh, with more, better, or another machine learning model, we can also get much higher accuracy. Uh, we can, for example, I think one thing you can do on the sentiment analysis is, is you can create uh, an n-gram number of words because as I have said earlier, on a single word, for example, let's say uh, uh, on a tweet, nice, for example, if the word is only nice, it only gives a specific meaning or a specific sentiment. You might classify that as a positive tweet, but the word before nice might be not. It, the word might be not nice. So you use a technical bigram or trigram for words or so on, which will you should be able to look at the words from the context, not only at a single word. So by using different techniques uh, like bigrams, we can for sure increase the accuracy uh, of our model and we can work on that. Uh, I'm really sorry, I haven't been uh, good at the time. Any questions, two to three questions before we wrap up the session? Okay. Gideon. 
Uh, hello. I was wondering for today's challenge, will we be using the the, the original text from the tweet to do it to our topic analysis and uh, and sentiment analysis, or will we be using other features as well? Uh, uh, what do you mean by other features? Uh, will we be just using the the the, the original tweets? <laughs> The, yes, the, the, yes, those will be your, your only data source for the sentiment analysis as well as the topic modeling. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other question? Uh, yes, because what we have used here is we have given, uh, okay, uh, I haven't shown that to you. Uh, we have used the X test in the Y train. We have used two label. We have, we have used a label data. The lab, by labeled, I mean uh, when you are also working on the Twitter data analysis, there is the sentiment column, right? After using the subjectivity and polarity, you can calculate you can calculate the sentiment of the uh, of that particular tweet. So by using that as a label, we we are trying to predict other tweets that are coming. Uh, from other sources. So those are serving us as our training data, but for the future or for uh, for unforeseen data, we'll be using the model that was built using those labels. So it's supervised learning. Yes, Anna. Okay, we need to generate the clean text. Yes, you are going to clean the data and finally pre-process it. So by pre-processing, the cleaning, the cleaning script that you find that you can find on the GitHub was only to drop duplicates, change the data format into the appropriate format. For example, the date format should be in a date format, the number should be in a number format or float format, and the string should be in a string format. After that, for natural language processing or, or when working on topic modeling and sentiment analysis, you'll have to pre-process the data. You'll have to remove special characters, punctuations, lemmatization, or different kind of techniques to uh, reduce it to its root word and finally make it ready for the model that you are going to work on. Uh, I'm confused on the discard challenge of. Uh, Yasabne, can you maybe speak up? Okay, so for the exploration, you can explore it. I mean, uh, you can even try to visualize how much of them are positive, how much of them are uh, negative, and you can also, uh, you can be creative and work maybe from which countries are most of the negative tweets coming, uh, and from which countries are most of the positive tweets coming. This kind of visualizations will be helpful, or these are also, this is also a summary of the data that you have. So finally, when you are presenting, you can say that these countries, these negative tweets are mostly coming from these, these, these countries and positive tweets are coming from these, these countries. You can be creative and try to uh, add more kind of exploratory data analysis, which should be helpful uh, to drive insight from the data that you have. Johannes? Okay, thank you, Lydia. Okay. For the nice explanation and tutorial. And my question is, so basically, we are going to use the original text uh, as a feature. The, we don't the original have... text, yes. Oh. Yes, because we are making the analysis based on the text that's being tweeted. OK. So you'll have to go through the processing steps in machine learning and try to make a prediction. So what we are going to use as a feature is the original text. By original text means uh, it should be processed. The original yeah, text. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Yes. yes. You'll only be using the original text or the clean text. Okay. okay. Any other question? Uh, Yasabnet, can you speak up? Are the challenge of which is similar to. Oh, okay. Great. So. Any more questions before we wrap up the session? Okay, Michael. 
thank you for uh, your efforts uh, trying to elaborate on these topics. Uh, I was just uh, wondering uh, uh, if we should have to first uh, remove uh, different uh, characters like ads uh, and hashes from the uh, extractor CSV file before going on to exploration and uh, uh, other steps? Uh, most of the time, uh, the, the pre-processing steps comes after expert ADA, or it might also come before the ADA, but most of the time you want to remove those characters or those type of uh, words, for example, you might want to reduce it to its root form after when you are going to uh, build a model of machine learning. For the EDA, you just want to show what data that you, the data that you have. You don't want to portray or give a different meaning by uh, doing some kind of preprocessing. You, in fact, yes, you, you will change the data format, the data types, or drop duplicates that don't matter. But this kind of special preprocessing are mostly done when you are going to feed that data to the machine learning model. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, then. Uh, thanks, guys. The academic team can stop the recording and we can wrap up the session. <laughs>